Can I please ask you to be seated so we can begin? Thank you very much. So this is the last panel uh, for the day. And again, the framing question has been very specifically identified in the papers that you have, so I will not repeat it. I will do what I did for the last panel, which is ask questions of each of the panelists. So we would like to kick off here by asking Professor uh, Hassan Ahmadian. And my question to him is this. I had the privilege of um, serving or working with the late uh, Henry Kissinger when he was Emeritus Chair of the Eisenhower Fellows, of which I am a trustee uh, in the United States. Kissinger once described Iran as either an ideology or a state. If it is an ideology, then that is consistent with the way it is trying to export that ideology by creating non-state actors and supporting them in various parts of the Middle East. And I here refer to Iraq, I refer to Lebanon, I refer to Yemen, I refer to Syria, and many others. So my question to Mr. Ahmadian is, why is Iran feeling the need to have these non-state actors in these countries? And to what extent does it exert control over them does it finance them, and does it expect that they do something in return for it? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me extend my thanks to the CCG and the Amersi Foundation, to you, sir, for uh, having me in this panel and uh, setting up this interesting uh, uh, event. Uh, I think uh, the issue of non-state actors uh, is not a, uh, an Iranian issue in the region. It goes well beyond Iran. It actu it's actually rooted in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the weakness of the nation state itself. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and the tree is the weakened nation state. And that apple that is the non-state actor comes as a result of that weakness. Now, Iran's national interest came in line with some of those non-state actors. It came against other non-state actors. And I think many countries actually used and propped up some of those non-state actors in the region. It's not only Iran, but Iran was successful, I guess, in dealing with them, in making use of the fact that its national interest and their national interest came in line. Uh, now, I think beyond the weakness of the nation state that couldn't basically face the challenges that was uh, inherent in its inception and also over time by the intervention, international interventions and uh, regional competitions, be it ideological or uh, geopolitics, uh, I think uh, uh, the nation state uh, weakness in dealing with those challenges brought up those parallel solutions. One of those parallel solutions were malicious. Some other parallel solutions were also brought up. But since we're focusing on those uh, non-state actors, primarily malicious, let me tell you that there are different reasons. In Lebanon, for instance, Hezbollah came as a result of occupation. It wasn't there before the 80s. Lebanon was occupied. Then Hezbollah came as a resistant movement and still is working as a resistant force. In northern Iraq, the Peshmerga force that then became the KRG army, basically, that force came a result of a brutal dictator who was arming to threaten an entire population who he gassed to death by chemical weapons. In Iraq itself, the rise of ISIS led to the emergence of non-state actors. In Palestine, that we are witnessing a genocide, the killing machine is still ongoing. The resistance and the non-state actors came a result of this lengthy occupation of the 
Palestinian territories. So I think there are different diverse reasons for the emergence of those actors. You can talk about Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, Yemen, all different uh, reasons for them. But I think the result is also leads us to the same issue, that is the weakness of the nation state. What to do about this moving forward? I think the strengthening of the nation state is key. And to strengthen the nation state, you need a more inclusive government within the, within the, within the countries. And also, you see, that not all governments are against non-state actors. Actually, many governments made use of those non-state actors to fulfill what they failed to do in defending their territorial integ uh, in integrity, to stop uh, uh, the, the terrorist organization from flourishing in their countries. So a more inclusive internal politics, a more harmonious region, here, I, I, I also should mention the Beijing agreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Helps a lot in bringing down the level of tension in the region, lead the region into a less tension-driven status that feeds into weakening of the nation state. And thirdly, I think a global, more balanced way of dealing with the, with the region, the Western previous dealing with the region has been imbalanced. Here, I think also China and other rising powers can play a key role in balancing off the Western influence and rule in the region to bring it a, into a more balanced setting where the regional states can interact with our, without much uh, you know, tension. The, uh, I want to put one more question to you, if I may. The cynic might say, and I say cynics, that it is in Iran's interests uh, to have these non-state actors across these four or five countries because through that it is able to very cheaply assert control over these countries and not allow them to flourish as independent sovereign states. Uh, a, what do you answer to that question? And secondly, what will it take Iran, if it's ever going to get there, to say, fine, we are now going to try and push for these non-state actors to become the legal, legitimate, political part of the uh, setup of these countries, just like the IRA became part of the government of Ireland. Um, we had the situation in, uh, in, in Sri Lanka, which we were discussing with our colleague here. The Tamil Tigers folded up. So what would it take Iran to say, let us now push for these militias to become part of the regular armed forces and allow these countries to flourish as independent states? Those two questions, but yes. short. Uh, I think uh, uh, you see the, the uh, basically each case has its own intricacies and different uh, uh, details uh, in, in dealing with non-state actors. I think the Iranians have actually pushed uh, their allies, many of their allies, to be uh, uh, merged into the national armies. In Iraq, it worked to some extent. Some are not still part of the uh, you know, armed forces. In Syria, the national defense forces are now part of the Syrian army. In Lebanon, there is resistance against Israel. There, the situation is very complex. It's not Iran's shot to, to, to basically call the shot in there and, and uh, ask the, the Hezbollah to move to uh, merge into the government. And I think they, they are in a very good term with the government there. In Yemen, there is another situation. Iran actually backed the Saudi Houthi deal that was very close before the uh, uh, 7th of October. Had it not been for that conflict, I think the deal would have been signed, and Iran was back in it. So there have been different ways of dealing with it and pushing for it, but I think uh, uh, what remains is the three categories that I mentioned. You need an inclusive government within that can embrace those bodies, not to alienate them, and you need a region and an international system that can basically give the floor to uh, uh, deprive the uh, uh, region uh, for the emergence uh, against the emergence of those kinds of non-state actors. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we will now turn to uh, Her Excellency Milia Jabour. Um, I think that many would say that Lebanon has brought it upon itself, and it is the people of Lebanon who are to blame for what we have there with Hezbollah, 
Um, we have a mall. We have many movements there. Some of them have, are militarized um, and are working independently of the regular army. It plays to Hassan's point that unless you have a strong state where its people believe that they want to create an independent state, the non-state actors will flourish. What would you say to that? Thank you, Dr. Amersi. Uh, first, I would like to thank you because I, the third panel is, I'm happy to be among a panel where we have more ladies than the first two panels, so I'm happy to be here. So, uh, to, the way it happened, it wasn't designed that way. Well, I'm happy to be among those ladies. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much. And probably a quick historical overview of the Middle East would help us uh, answer your question. Um, because if we want to better understand the contemporary uh, Arab region, it, we, it requires stepping back from the present and taking a long view of the evolution of states and sovereignty, because you're, taking, you're talking about non-state actors, evolution of states and sovereignty in the modern Middle East. I'm not going to do that because it requires lots of time, but it is worth noting that the architecture of the region was created by Sykes-Picot. We, we should not ever forget that. This is an informal and secret agreement between Britain and France sketched out during World War I to divide up the post-Ottoman region and through which borders were imposed by former colonial powers. With the same importance as Sykes-Picot came the infamous Balfour Declaration issued by the British government in 1917, announcing its support for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. This is a bit the context of what we are going through today. And one of the key factors that brought the Arab world to the point of turbulence we are in today is the Arab-Israeli conflict, which is the oldest and most serious destabilizing force in the region and has plagued us all since the 30s over the course of the years with four major Arab-Israeli wars and hundreds, more than hundred, non-respected international resolutions, non-respected by Israel, plus the fact that the USA major power in the Middle East and other Western societies seem to pay more attention to the security and rights of Israelis than to those of Palestinians and Arabs. This chronic imbalance generated considerable anger and frustration among the populations of the Middle East. This tension was built over decades and was one of the important factors in the growth of movements in the 80s whose ideology was to fight particularly against Israeli occupation of Arab lands. Take, talking about statehood and sovereignty, the general principles, patterns, and conceptions of statehood and sovereignty of the Westphalian system have evolved over time, and in more recent times, the idea of a nation's right to exercise its sovereignty is being challenged in different parts of the world by various organizations, as well as from proponents of humanitarian intervention. The system has been also challenged by the presence of wide array of multiple actors and a myriad of categories of non-state actors. These can be sub-state actors, such as labor unions, large companies, professional associations, religious communities, or transnational actors, such as non-governmental organizations like the Red Cross or Greenpeace. The term also includes criminal networks and politically violent actors like ISIS or Al-Qaeda. It can include also quasi-military organizations, militias, national liberation, uh, liberation movements, guerrillas. Non-state actors differ greatly in nature, so too their interaction with the states. This is what uh, Dr. Hassan talked about, their interaction with the states. Non-state actors in the Middle East are not merely the expression of a state vacuum where they take on certain roles states traditionally fill. Rather, some states purposefully outsource some of their tasks to non-state actors co-opt non-state actors to their own advantage or tolerate them. The different ways in which states choose to interact with non-state 
actors stems from the state's raison d'etre. Thus, a non-state actor can fold into the state's purposes, be it by providing security, welfare, or charity, or by acting as a representative of a given community within the state. For example, Lebanon has outsourced a key area of governance to a sub-state actor. Our personal status law fall into the realm of the religious communities recognized by the state. Hezbollah, as one of the major political party, has very extensive activities, including construction work to repair war damages caused by Israel. It also provides health care and social services. They do it within the context of the state. It also became a large representative of community interests, like the Shia interests, in a similar way to political parties and democracies. Furthermore, Hezbollah continues to operate as the country's legitimate resistance against Israeli occupation, thus maintaining an asymmetric defense posture which protects Lebanon from Israeli retaliations. Sometimes, so those non-state actors can also take a more antagonistic forms where the non-state actor challenges the regime or the political system in place, usually legitimizing its own existence by disproving the state's capacity to deliver. Examples are those which seek mainly to destabilize the state, such as Al-Qaeda, or even to replace an existing one like ISIS. In an apparently unmanageable overlay of domestic, regional, and global power struggle in the Middle East, major, big, and regional powers confront each other on battlefields beyond their own territory by proxy wars. Some strong non-state challengers can become very influential in shaping the regional balance of power and with rival and allied states each seeking to influence and control rival networks, the result is a turbulent regional system in which state interests are often hard to discern and shift in complex way. Nevertheless, nevertheless, some lessons could be learned from the case of Lebanon, where in spite of the frequent political instability and regional insecurity, there can be an approach to some degree a temporary alternative where the dynamics of security politics in Lebanon can be understood through the lens of what some intellectuals call hybrid sovereignty. Such an approach suggests how an assemblage of state and non-state actors has been able to navigate between rival understandings of insecurity, producing at times shared but still contested understandings which have sustained a system of plural governance over security that has been able to respond to a shifting geography of state. Filled, I, I finish with that, filled with that tensions, security politics in Lebanon requires perpetual adjustments to avoid collapse or to avoid internal war as occurred between 75 and 90. This is a chapter which nobody wants to experience again, even at a great cost. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very insightful um, analysis of uh, Lebanon. I now try, uh, turn to Allah Talabani. Allah, first of all, thank you very much for taking the trouble to come all this way. It's a real pleasure to see you here again. Last time we were in Baghdad together. Uh, you have a, a, a very amazing vantage point. You are from Kurdistan and you were a member of the Iraqi parliament where you saw how all of these Shia-backed paramilitary units were in a way running riot and trying to stop the state from being able to behave uh, as a state. How do you see the future of that? Is that a problem for internal Iraqi people and the Shia people of Iraq? Or do you feel that on balance this is Iran trying to extend its, uh, its influence in Iraqi affairs? Um, thank you so much for this great opportunity, Mr. Mercy. It's an uh, honor to be here. This is my first visit to China and to attend such an important forum. And um, so thank you so much for your invitation. And I'm so happy to meet so many good friends as we met earlier in Baghdad and at my place and then here in Pekin. 
Well, this is a good question. You mentioned at the beginning that this part of the whole conversation and panel, you like it so much, I like it as well, because it's kindly a daily base concern for us as an Iraqi. When I was in the parliament for 16 years, and I work as an advisor to this, our new prime minister for a while, and I'm working with civil society now. Um, I like the title here about sovereignty. I think, and I can say that Iraq is the, one of the most countries who are suffering from the violence of sovereignty. Um, many, for many reasons and different reasons. Some of them are local, interior, and some of them are external. Uh, because of the interests of other countries in Iraq. Sometimes we say Iraq is an arena for other parties and countries' conflict. Um, and there's many examples. Um, as, for example, Turkey, between time and time, they are bombing some areas in Iraq, in northern Iraq. They are assassinating some individuals. Uh, under the name of protecting their national security and defending terrorism, of course, the PKK. And so far, there is no uh, any, um, an, 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 an action, official action toward this. Uh, there is some will, some, uh, in the government is trying to do some uh, uh, agreement with Turkey, uh, I mean, of course, security agreement. But why we cannot stop this? Because we have Iran in the other sides. They are uh, bombing uh, places inside Iraq uh, through their partners, of course, through some militias, which I will explain, because we are dividing them to legal militias, or let's say legal armed forces, which under the umbrella of Hajj al-Shaabi. Uh, yeah, but uh, some of them are not, because the whole country and the government are suffering with dealing with these forces. So when they are bombing, and Iran are not denying that they are bombing places in Erbil, in Kurdistan region, and there is between time and time bombing the American forces, the American embassy in Baghdad. Uh, of course, American in return are also uh, attacking some militias uh, places inside Iraq. They, are, they assassinated two important figures inside Iraq in the road to the airport in the capital city. So this is a big violation on the sovereignty of Iraq. So, and they assassinated someone like uh, Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis. For Iraqi people, Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis is a hero. He liberated the country from ISIS. S uh, so imagine all this happening uh, in Iraq with diversity between Iraqi political parties. I was in the parliament. Um, first of all, before talking about uh, the, what happened in the parliament and the legal action towards the Hajj al-Shaabi and militias, nobody can deny the important fatwa of our marja'iyah in Najaf, uh, the marja'iyah uh, fatwa of jihad. And here, when the uh, Hajj al-Shaabi created, and then there was this discussion and agreement uh, or disagreement and um, argument in the parliament. At that time, I was the head of my party, political party bloc in the parliament, on uh, turning Hajj al-Shaabi to an organized legal armed forces. Uh, we were very much divided. Of course, the Sh Shia parties were with, the Sunni party were against. The Kurdish has very concern, uh, but in the end, with the majority, it was passed. My, I myself, I was with the putting Hajj al-Shaabi in a legal frame. But here is the question. After we did that, and it's an official organization and an official institution, the question here, is Hajj al-Shaabi subordinate to the order of the chief com commander, chief of uh, armed forces, which is the prime minister, let's say Sudani, the answer, not always. Let's not forget, Mr. Uh, Ahmadian talked about Peshmerga. 
I'm Kurdish. I was a freedom fighter for a long time. And uh, we are proud of the Peshmerga. But at the same time, Peshmerga again, uh, they are not uh, taking their orders from the prime minister, from the commander in chief of the uh, uh, armed forces. They are taking their orders from Kurdistan presidency or let's say parties. Even Peshmergas are divided between PK and KDP, the two main Kurdish party. So this is all makes very big concerns for us. And fortunately so far, we were unable to organize this. Um, Kuwait, between time and time, you know, the relation between Iraq and Kuwait. Then the right of Kuwait of Khor Abdullah by Security Council uh, agreement in 1993 after the invasion. And later on, this agreement that happened, um, I mean, kind of understanding happened between Iraq and Kuwait, and it was rejected by parliament and by Sperma court. Uh, and so still this is continuing argument. Thanks God, the relation with Saudi is very good now. After 40 years, we have signed a security agreement. And our prime minister, well, let's be honest, the previous prime minister, al Qadimi, he started the relations and opening good relations with Saudi Arabia, going towards economy. So beside uh, and opening the RR, uh, RR uh, uh, port, which was also closed for decades, this all sounds to be good relations or good, uh, um, yes, um, agreement between Iraq and Saudi after a long time of not having even political or uh, diplomatic missions in both countries. Now we have good diplomatic mission there, and Saudi, they have an amazing ambassador in Baghdad who's close to everyone, Shia, Sunnah, and Kurd. Back to your question, uh, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Mr. Uh, Amersi. In Ira within Iraqi society, people are concerned of all this armed in the street and with the in the hand of different groups. Some of these groups, they have members in the parliament. They have offices open legally under the law of the parties. They have economic offices, which they are playing big role in the economy of Iraq. But their armies are not under the control of Iraqi uh, formal forces. Some of them are not. Yani they are um, outside these big orders. So that's concern. For example, today all Iraqi people wake up with the uh, news of assassinating or a big explosion, sorry, happened in KFC shop in Baghdad. This is wrong messages. You know, it has different meaning and messages, but this is very bad messages for Iraq and Iraqi people. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your um, very uh, touching remarks as to what you have been through post uh, 20 years now and hopefully inshallah very soon the country will find peace and stability. Thank you. I now turn to Yasmin Iriani. She's from uh, Yemen and she has a very good understanding of the dynamics that played out uh, in Yemen. And the question is more or less the same for her as well. Are the Houthis a force for good or are they a force for division and um, to stop the country from becoming united and a sovereign state? How do you see it going forward? Thank you first uh, for, for inviting me, for arranging for these Middle East and uh, China uh, panels. I think they're very important and, and timely. Um, Your Royal Highness, Excellencies, and, and everyone, and of course the organizers, uh, Amersi uh, Foundation and CCG. Um, before I answer your question, which is very direct about, uh, about the Houthis, and I will answer it, but before I do that, um, I want to kind of zoom out a little bit, because in the last two days, we heard uh, of multiple global crises. Uh, from uh, a weakening of world order, uh, rule-based uh, order, uh, weak multilateralism, um, uh, geopolitical competition that is uh, impacting negatively the global south, and so on. And I believe that Yemen is um, a microcosm of all these crises, uh, quite condensed. 
uh, and I think it's an example of what happens when you leave these crises uh, unaddressed. Uh, so the Houthis, is, they're a symptom of uh, a, a long uh, period of crisis in Yemen, which in one way or another has something to do with all these more global crises. They are not only specific to, uh, to Yemen. Um, the, the Houthis captured the state in 2014. Uh, they um, took control from a leg legitimate uh, government. Um, we were in a transition, transitional period that was struggling, but it was moving forward. We were trying to escape a fall into a full-blown conflict, uh, but we were drawn into it. I think Yemen now is in a very critical situation as a state. Uh, it risks uh, fragmentation, it risks uh, long-term conflict, and um, I believe the Houthis uh, have a very big role to play uh, here. The Houthis as a group is also not one that would be willing to share power with other Yemeni uh, parties. And Yemen uh, has been enjoying uh, political pluralism for the past uh, several decades, so this is not new to Yemen. And there is very little tolerance to um, a, a governance that governs alone, that uh, you know, one party or one group that, that governs without the others. So I, I believe that this will not pass in Yemen. Uh, but how will it unfold? I think that's the critical question. In terms of what, you know, what the, the title of the panel is, sovereignty and, and non-state actors, I mean, there's an array of non-state actors in Yemen. And, of course, the Houthis are uh, the most, the strongest. They are uh, strong militarily. They have also used the last um, 10 plus years to uh, to really consolidate power, uh, while their uh, opponents continue to be very weak and fragmented and divided between them. But there are other non-state actors uh, in Yemen, uh, armed uh, and with different uh, political projects. Some of them are together in the government of Yemen, or the internationally recognized government. And they are backed by, uh, by regional states, including Saudi Arabia and UAE, and to some extent also Oman. Uh, and they're competing with each other, which means that there is no chance to stand in the, in the face of quite a coherent uh, organization like the Houthis. The Houthis um, seem to have a long-term strategy. They are calculating uh, their next moves. Um, and they have a world view that is uh, anchoring them in, uh, in broader regional and world politics. And they believe that they have a position within that world view. Um, their opponents do not seem to have a strategy. And this, uh, this makes a very uh, complex situation in Yemen because at the same time, it, I find it very difficult to conceive of a broad acceptance of the Houthis across Yemen, although we know that they do have expansionist um, ambitions, um, maybe even beyond Yemen, uh, according to their uh, political discourse. Uh, so I think we have been underestimating their, their ambitions uh, in Yemen. And this is, a, this is a failure of judgment that we will have to deal with, and we see now this escalation in the Red Sea. Uh, that I think has uh, global uh, repercussions. We also have other armed groups besides those that are within the nominally, um, uh, the, you know, the, the government of Yemen uh, and the Houthis. We have Al-Qaeda and Islamic State. Al-Qaeda is a bit stronger in Yemen compared to Islamic State. They have some footing, although they have been retreating uh, since 2015, they are now um, gaining strength. New leadership, new source of revenue, and collaboration with what was seen before as an antithesis to Al-Qaeda, which is the Houthis. They are collaborating with the Houthis. They are receiving um, drone technology, for example, from the Houthis. We know that the Houthis are also collaborating with Al-Shabaab across the Red Sea and the Somalia coast, uh, which means we are moving in a very quick uh, path towards 
a complete militarization of a very important uh, water cho choke point, which is the Red Sea, but also a threat to the Mediterranean, which is another water uh, choke point. I think the world is moving into this, uh, really sleepwalking into this. And uh, I don't see at the moment uh, a clear strategy to, uh, to address these risks. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your remarks. Uh, again, very helpful. Um, I will now turn to our uh, Chinese colleagues here. Uh, let me start with uh, Zishan Wang. He was uh, in Baghdad. Um, at the Baghdad Dialogue. He met a lot of the Iraqi uh, participants there. I think he's got a good understanding of what Iraq, what works in Iraq, what doesn't work in Iraq. What is China's attitude in terms of tolerating or even accepting that non-state actors should be allowed to, um, as it were, play a part, whatever part it is, in some of these Middle East countries in which China has become by far their biggest trading partner and in some cases political partner. Does it tolerate this or should, is it trying to find ways to um, mitigate this by, f by disarming them, requiring them to become part of the political structures in the country where they operate? Thank you, Mr. Mercy. Uh, it's a great privilege to be on this panel, and uh, uh, as you so your foundation made this possible, and uh, I work with CCG, so I will not thank my boss here. And uh, it's, uh, it's great to be in front of His Royal Highness, and also some friends that, as you correctly mentioned, that I came across uh, in Baghdad. So uh, that is actually a very interesting question. And some of the panel members have talked about, you know, non-state actors. I think the situation in China is actually quite unique. I think the People's Republic of China, with the Communist Party of uh, China in leadership, is known to be, and that it is uh, very proud of a very strong centralized state. And uh, uh, throughout Chinese history, the tradition here has always been that uh, you know, a strong uh, central government is what the people are used to. And uh, when the country is fragmented, when the country is in chaos, uh, the natural tendency of the, uh, of the Chinese people across many generations of its leading uh, intellectuals, people want a central and uh, uh, strong state. So I think that's some, something very uh, crucial, a difference between the reality in the Middle East and uh, uh, the People's Republic of China uh, today. And uh, uh, you all talked about a lot of very specific cases in the Middle East. And uh, uh, as we all know, uh, at this, uh, this particular moment and for many years uh, before that, the United States remained the number one, let's say, uh, as the theme of the panel says, outside interference uh, from the region. And uh, Chinese uh, approach and its uh, collaboration with uh, uh, countries in the Middle East has largely been uh, economical. And uh, so China is, uh, I think uh, for the past uh, 10 years, and uh, so Chinese have been trying to enhance its uh, involvement in the Middle East, and, uh, but still the emphasis is largely economical and uh, China set up a military logistical uh, base in Djibouti, but China officially maintains it is not a military base, uh, whereas you know, the United States maintains many uh, military bases uh, across the region. So I think uh, f for the Chinese, it's still not at the level of uh, outside interfer interference into the region as uh, the United States or, be or before that, uh, the Great Britain. And uh, as Professor uh, Hamadian uh, alluded to in the, in the initial remarks, that there is a uh, speculation, or maybe to some extent, I think, a hope for uh, emerging powers, maybe like China, to get more involved in the region. And uh, uh, so uh, I, I'm not exactly sure that's uh, Beijing's interest at this particular moment, because you know, I think one thing that lingers uh, in the background is the 
rivalry between China and the United States. It has grown increasingly global in that all regions of the world have been drawn into the strategic competition between the two countries. Nevertheless, the degree and the pattern of involvement of these uh, regions differ. Comparatively speaking, uh, I think the Middle East is among the least affected regions uh, in terms of uh, China-US competition. From the perspective of functions, uh, the Middle East, I think excluding Israel, does not belong to the US-led alliances. And uh, obviously, among the various types of alliances formed by the United States to counter, uh, to counter China, the Middle East uh, falls into the category of, uh, how should I put it, loosely organized alliances throughout the world that are intended to weaken China's influence. It's vastly different from the NATO or from the US um, alliances with certain countries in terms of science and technology, which it's, uh, you know, imposes uh, technology export control against China. So in contrast to the increasingly intense global strategic environment, I think the atmosphere in Middle East vis-a-vis -vis China and the United States relations is actually relatively favorable. The two countries do not have obvious conflicts there on regional affairs. With the United States implementing a strategic contraction, China has maintained a relatively neutral uh, Middle Eastern policy. As a result, I think countries of the region uh, barely face any pressure to choose sides. To be sure, the disagreements frequently rise, but uh, until now, I think they, uh, the differences between the two powers have been limited to mutual criticism and uh, non-cooperation, which is still a long way uh, from uh, direct uh, confrontation. Thank you very much uh, for your comments. Uh, for the last panelist now, um, I would ask um, uh, He Wenpeng, do I pronounce that right? Yeah, actually it's a her. <laughs> her Wenpeng. But I'm getting used to be called Professor He. It's okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> forgive, right. forgive me. So my question to you is going to be, the definition of non-state actors must be very odd to China because such an animal does not exist in Chinese political uh, as well as uh, social um, structures. Now, you are involved with social sciences. So how does China actually see non-state actors, i.e. a state within a state? Is this something that people understand how this phenomena works here? Uh, yes, as you can see, huh, my uh, research, you know, this organization called Western Asia and African Study, uh, this institute affiliated with Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. So you see in the uh, Middle East and Africa, we call Middle East uh, Western Asian. So in this uh, large area, actually a lot of those are non-state actors. Uh, for example, in Somalia, a lot of warlords. You see, after uh, the end of the Cold War, and now even in the Western, uh, you know, African country, those Sahara, those, those places, a lot of terrorist, uh, you know, activity and the non-state, those uh, actors playing a lot of role. Uh, even in the Middle East area, we just heard the situation has been introduced from Lebanon, Iraqi, and Yemen. So now nobody not knowing, uh, you know, Hezbollah, uh, like a whole thing, uh, you see a lot of miniatures uh, in that area. That's why uh, being the outsider observer uh, to look around about the Middle East uh, situation, because today the major thing we talk about is there's a Palestine and the Israel, this conflict. You see, so even though there is a talking going on uh, in Cairo, a lot of negotiation, and then parallelly uh, we see this Houthis, you know, make some action uh, in the Red Sea, even also damage it. I think also China's interests, because we have a lot of those, uh, you know, business going on, uh, those commodities, this uh, global supply chain now has been damaged. This is also, uh, you know, damaged to this global economic recovery. So nobody saying we can stay outside of this picture. So you see, I really agree, uh, previous uh, panelists just mentioned how this issue coming, you know, in that way, uh, in the Middle East, a lot of this uh, non-state actor, how to understand their role. I think it's a double-edged sword. You know, when this country really out of control, or uh, even this state actor now seems nowhere. So that's why I uh, make this, uh, you know, this uh, soil being uh, paved for these non-state actors. They can survive. They even can be uh, built on their power and getting stronger and stronger. 
So the, even I have students ask me, saying, "What is the Hasbara? Is a, what is the the, the relationship huh, between uh, their forces and the with the state? Uh, these forces, the military troops, uh, you know, in the control by Lebanon government. So you see, it's a very difficult question. Similar, like who uh, see these uh, forces uh, is under whose control? So this is the uh, when state is becoming weak. Of course, non-state actors getting stronger. So this is like this way, right? And even, I think this uh, this our final panel, uh, this topic is well, very good chosen because we also need to talk about independence and sovereignty and also outside interference. Yeah, like my uh, friends just mentioned, uh, my colleague panelists uh, just mentioned, those assassination uh, from outside uh, of this Middle East. And those assassination ignore sovereignty of the Iraqi. Ignore the sovereignty, like Lebanon, huh? all the countries. So when your sovereignty and also this independence now getting weaker and weaker and weaker, so that's, that's why we see a lot of other players, they are show up, uh, they are ahead. Now they are playing around. And they even make those mainstream talk, uh, like those talking in, uh, in Cairo, now seems step forward, and then maybe two steps back. And then who is the player? Maybe some. A non-state actor, they doesn't want to see those things move into that direction because they don't want to see. So a lot of uh, uh, those, uh, you see the attack and even assassination happening. And also, it's very tough because I've been doing international relations, this study and then research for decades. You know, when you're looking about world history, uh, even state actors playing around Ah, together with these non-state actors. Yeah, when something state actors cannot do uh, on the surface, uh, maybe then uh, those non-state actors will do for them uh, under the table. So those things, we don't know the secrets. Many, many things is confidential. Uh, code is confidential. So maybe years, years later, decades, decades later, and then we got to know something happened during the Second World War, even First World War. So why those war immediately broke out? And then you find it's not those reasons we have been taught by the media. Actually, it's other reasons, very deep. So this is the issue. They're all intertwined uh, with each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now invite, thank you, uh, a couple of interventions from the floor. Let's start with His Excellency Mohammed Hasnain Khadam, Ambassador of Syria. Uh, this phenomena of non-state actors you also see uh, in Syria in quite a way. Some are for the government of President Assad, some are against the government of, uh, of President Assad. So how does this play in Syria? And again, it would be helpful if you could um, confine your remarks to three or four minutes so we can give uh, some people time to speak as well. Thank you. Three pages only. Thank you very much. I, I must thank you, Mr. Amarsi, Mr. Wang, for uh, hosting this very important forum. I must uh, be honored with the presence of his uh, 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 Prince uh, Turkey, honored to. Uh, in fact, I will elaborate. I prepared some quotations, and I build my case as uh, the, the players in the region are a reaction, reactionary players for the main player, which is, in fact, the U.S. and Israel. As uh, Her Excellency, the ambassador of Lebanon mentioned the sex pico, uh, dividing the region, irrespective of uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty, creating sub-sovereignties. I used to state in the beginning that the term non-state actors is a euphemistic, euphemistic misnomer that sits on the border of terrorism and just struggle, obfuscated for a long time due to lack of a clear definition international definition of terrorism. Uh, an effort my country called for in the 80s last century, but was hampered by many Western countries, but mainly the USA. Of course, the lack of clear definition of terrorism gives gray space for foul play. And let me here quote uh, Senator Hillary Clinton. We created Al-Qaeda. 30 years after the creation of Haiti. Uh, 
the liberation movements for the Palestinian issue are a continuation of the liberation movements that spread throughout the 40s and 50s of last century. They were self-created. The Palestinian cause remains, remains the oldest unresolved question in spite of tens, if not hundreds, of UN resolutions that clarify the solution. Uh, in full support of the occupation force and the internal, for internal or geopolitical uh, reasons, the U.S. did its best to avoid all routes that lead to a just solution. And instead, it reverted to destabilizing the region or restructuring the region. I will give a few examples. You know, you feel that maybe Henry Kissinger was a Tiresias when he uh, uh, founded the State Department terrorist list. The first four countries, by the way, just compare the situation in the first, first four countries. And uh, they were enlisted in 1979, was Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Libya. So the vision from those days is clear for what was to come. Uh, I don't need to elaborate here. The second issue, uh, 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 in 2001, after the 9-11 terrorist attack, the Bush administration adopted the prescription provided six years earlier uh, by the so-called neocons or another misnomer in the Middle East, referring to the pro-Israel lobby, it's a clean break, new strategy for securing the realm. I don't know, it's not that much known, but this is the policy adopted by the Bush administration and still ongoing. Uh, uh, the lead figure in that strategy was Netanyahu and other neocons. Uh, the plan is still in play and is based on the principle, please check it on the internet, it's there available. Peace is dangerous for Israel. So we have to provide a new approach to solving Israel's security problems. Thank you. Which included, this is listed, toppling Saddam Hussein, containment of Syria, by engaging in proxy warfare and highlighting its possession of weapons of mass destruction. Very pertinent until now. This is 1996, by the way. About Syria, I wish to quote a certain official in, the, uh, in one administration. In, uh, was related to constructive instability. You know, after the invasion of Iraq and do domino effect, democratize, democratizing the region, etc. In fact, the main reason was the security, securing Israel. Of course, three priorities for the U.S. administration towards Syria. First, it should gather as much as intelligence on the political, social, economic, and ethnic forces at work in Syria. It should conduct a campaign around democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. And it should offer the Syrian regime no lifelines unless President Bashar al-Assad, this is very important, is prepared to go to Israel as a part of a peace initiative. Thank you. Or to expel all anti-peace terrorist organization and their members from Syria. Uh, of course, this is no better explanation about the connection of what's going on in Syria and the Palestinian issue, the core issue of the Middle East. Uh, this is why I Thank you. We wish to mention, I Thank still you. have a few lines, uh, that there is no non-state actors. In fact, all terrorist groups in Syria are financed and uh, formed from outside the border. Uh, of course, this is amongst 
hundreds of such quotations. Uh, the questions I want to find, uh, finalize this, uh, the question raised in Washington now by non-state thinkers is whether Israel is an asset or a liability uh, for the U.S. in the Middle East and internationally, especially after the recent episode of genocide in uh, Palestine. The whole Middle East question was built on invalidated presumptions for decades. I will state a few. Palestine has been inhabited by its own people for millennia. They are th now thrown in the sea. Thank you. Uh, Judaism, like Islam and Christianity, uh, is a heritage of our region. People lived in harmony throughout the centuries. The region is paying the price of certain Western crimes may be committed against certain groups, and they are repenting with our blood. Uh, of course, the Palestinian issue will never die without a solution. Um, this, is, uh, this is all I want to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your remarks. They're highly appreciated. Um, I would now ask uh, Professor Hadian, uh, and let me put to him an alternate model uh, in place of the non-state actors for Iran to think. So, uh, many people would say that after the Iraq-Iran war, after the imposition of sanctions on Iran, as both uh, Dr. Musavi and Dr. Sajadpur said that even after signing the JCPOA, Iran was subjected to the most brutal sanctions regime that the world has ever seen. And Iran some would say legitimately exercised its rights of self-defense to ensure that it can never ever face a situation where its neighbors can attack it again and this it does by having uh, non-state actors or supporting non-state actors in its neighbors. But would an alternate model where Iran would say to these non-state actors, why don't you become part of the main political process? Why don't you get yourselves into political parties, and then ask your state to sign security guarantees with Iran in the way that perhaps the GCC, in the way that NATO, in the way that European Union frameworks work, so it can get the security and protection it needs, but at the same time it would allow these countries to exercise their independence, to develop, and to become sovereign. Is this something Iran might consider one day? Thank you very much. Thank you and CCG for inviting me. Uh, let me, for a couple of minutes, uh, lay out a framework uh, for my discussion and my response. Uh, number one is, you know, we can address this issue at three levels. At the international order level, at the regional level, and at the national level. I guess so far many of our colleagues have addressed the issue from within the national level. Uh, I don't like to engage in the international level. I just say that, you know, international order is extremely important for the generation of uh, non-state actor, provided, of course, I assume we understand what non-state actor. I was thinking whether Brookings, uh, Carnegie, are they non-state actors, or only they are non-state thinkers. But anyway, that's very complicated concept uh, to be conceptualized. Okay, but for the sake of our discussion, I assume we understand, we have a general understanding of what that is. So rather than going to the international level or national level, I would like to concentrate for a couple of minutes on, uh, which would address your question to, uh, I would like to address it at a regional level. You know, to me, uh, Two important uh, events or changes happened in our region, in the Middle East. There was a balance and imbalance. There was a balance of power in the sub-region of Persian Gulf between Iran and Iraq. Thanks to American invasion, that changed to an imbalance. And the whole discussion for a couple of decades now is to reconstituting 
that previous balance. But there was an imbalance at the region of uh, uh, Middle East. And the imbalance was Israel was acting like a superpower to the rest. And there was supposed to be a military edge uh, that keep the Israelis to be in that position. That imbalance, to a large extent, at least in our perception in the region, has changed to a balance. And it has a couple of important elements in it. Number one is Iran's missile program. Number two is Iran's nuclear program. And number three is these non so-called non-state actors. Non-state actors is a part of Iran's basically deterrence. We have or tried to build policy, a comprehensive, yeah. comprehensive deterrence belt around Israel. Thus, in order to keep that balance in the region, in order to create that uh, deterrence belt, thus Iran has relied on important allies like the non-state actors. Thank you. So that these are the reasons, unless the root causes of, at the three level, international level, regional level, national level, unless we address them, we, are not, we cannot resolve this issue of sure. non-state actors. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've now got requests from three uh, members from the floor to make comments. Uh, they are Mr. Fadlallah from Lebanon, Mr. Raghab al Hussein from Syria. You don't want to? Okay, and Isabel Zaidan from Syria. So we will start with Mr. Fadlallah first. Thank you very much. I have some comments about the three panels. The uh, first one is about the separation between, between the non state actors and resistant groups. Non state actors related to the failed state, the state or the three level security and economic and social level and institutional level that could be absorbed in uh, a lot of countries in the region, not only the country including resisting groups. You didn't, you don't man mention the situation of Libya, the situation of Sudan, the situation of Mauritania. The non-state actor is, uh, uh, is in Israel itself. This is a, a phenomena not only in the land of resistance in the uh, uh, region. But the resistance group is related to other factors, related to the uh, failed, uh, the absence of security doctrine and national security, solid doctrine in the region and some countries, but related also in the imbalance in this country between Israel in one side and other countries in uh, other sides. How to deal, how to address this big problem which conduct the, and the escalate the tension and the problem and the conflict in the region. The resistance is one of answers on this challenging because there is no uh, a comprehensive regional National, uh, regional security, national security to address this problem. The second issue about Lebanon, I agree with his, Her Excellency about the comment, but we could not forget the sanction as a main factor in Lebanon and in other countries as a factor of tensions and, and conflict. We need a non state actors at the economic level and social level to avoid, to prevent this controlling, this controlled sanction and the uh, uh, several of sanctions, laws and uh, uh, acts is accepted by some countries. We need to revise all this uh, concept if we address the problem, the security problem in the, in the region. And we need a comprehensive and cooperative 
security doctrine uh, between all countries, including Iran and C Turkey, and uh, uh, most of Arab countries. Thank you. Um, Isabel. Thank you, Mr. Amersi. Uh, first of all, I would like to talk uh, as... Uh, my name is Isabella Zaidan. I came from Syria, and I'm the head of the external relations of Asham Private University and one of the newborn universities in Syria throughout the hardship and the times of sanctions. Uh, first of all, I will talk as a linguist, and I will talk uh, about the first threat that would threaten the region and the sovereignty and the independence of these states in the region, which is the stereotypes. And we all know that the main, uh, the basis, one of the basis for these stereotypes comes from the study of genes, which started uh, by the study of languages. When they said, for example, it started when we started, uh, they, we, they said that the, Ar the, Ar the Aryan uh, race, uh, when they said the Indian has uh, something in common with the, with the European because of the language, similarities between language. And then it went on with the study of the bones. And they said, it's uh, start by studying the dimension of skulls, you could know the race of the person and when they where they come from and uh, how smart these races are or how smart they, uh, or can they be submissive or they, are they dominant? Should we rule them? And we know that how it was the start of the suffering of many, 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 uh, nations, uh, especially in Africa. And we moved on to the study of genes through blood test, DNA, which uh, has been used by Zionism. And when they said that there is a new race uh, called the uh, Jew Jewish race. Uh, and this, of course, has been refuted by many, many uh, uh, Israeli uh, 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 experts, not Arabs, not Syrian, not from the region, the Arab region, not Iranian. It has been refuted by the Israeli experts themselves that there is nothing so called uh, a Jew race. Uh, as a linguist, I would see these studies and these Oriental, let's say, um, I don't have any other naming for it. And this, this Oriental view projected on the people uh, comes, as a linguist, I see it projected on the language addressing our people. For example, when you see, I mean, I don't know what happened to the world or how many, uh, uh, let's say, uh, journalists are left to see Netanyahu writing uh, an article for the Washington Post saying the battle of the civilization against barbarism based on studies and gene, studies of the genes and the blood tests and blah, 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 with, which will be refuted in the future, and the people would find that it is as false as the study of bones and skulls and skeletons was wrong. Uh, so for us, we have to work on that, and we, we can see that this kind of studies is being, is being projected on the language of the media, the language of politicians, and the language of administration, addressing people like my people in Syria, people in Gaza. We have suffered a lot from stereotypes that based on these, um, let's say, false studies, and the reason I'm saying false is not because I'm saying my opinion. They are not based on a, uh, let's say, um, right academic criteria. Uh, concerning, I'm not going to talk about the economic uh, state actors because uh, Dr. Fadlallah said enough. What I'm going to say about non-state actors is that uh, the, the factions uh, uh, existed in the region is that they used, I mean, the members of these factions, the, the members of these groups, they were young boys who were raised up in an area, for example, let's say Gaza, and they grew up seeing someone taking over their land, killing their families, and they grew up seeing the person, or let's say the party that was responsible for killing their family, taking over their lands, getting away with it, right before the eye of the international law, right before the eye of the international community. And they were never held resp responsible. And this is, this is where those young children and young men, they grew up giving up on, on international diplomacy, international law, 
and they just decided to take, that, take up the fight trying to defend the land. So if we want this to end, just apply international law, especially on the uh, temporary entity of Israel, as much as we apply it on other countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very well said, Isabel. My last question will be to um, uh, Sheikh Sayyid Hassan al-Hakim and Sheikh Mohammed al-Najm. You've heard from Allah Talabani a deep cry for help, a deep cry for assistance. You had Saddam Hussein in Iraq that brutalized so many people. After that, there have been 20 years of turbulence and the country has not been able to find its feet. It is such a rich country, probably one of the largest oil producers in terms of uh, uh, considering its population size, but yet it is not able to prosper. How would you support Allah uh, from Sheikh Mohammed Najm and then from Ehsan al-Hakim? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Well, uh, Allah Talabani uh, described the situation very, uh, very in a bright way. But I think that <clears throat> Iraq now, at the moment, is, is growing for, uh, within its sovereignty and within the uh, Iraq dialogue between all the parties growing for building their country for a better future. Although there is some struggle because of the, the foreign countries, there is a struggle between Iran and the U.S. about Iraq. What happened after 2003 because of all the suffering from the previous dictator. But I think our aim as Iraqi to rebuild our country, to continue the democratic reforms, to have our region stable, and I think stability is very important. We should, we should seek for, you know, the Arab states, especially the Islamic states, to help us for that. Of course, international community should play a uh, positive role in that, so that the region will be more stable. This is my... Uh, comment on that. There are some other comments about the nuclear uh, 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 nuclear weapons and other, uh, other things and I think the ambassadors and others addressed this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Said Hassan, do you want to say a few words? Thank you very much, Mr. Amasi, for this opportunity. Basically, I was not preparing to speak. Uh, I just had a small comment on what I heard today from everyone. It was a rich uh, co um, uh, speech from everyone, so thank you very much. Uh, basically, I believe, uh, maybe it's more dream than reality, but I believe uh, the solution always going through dialogue and speech, never through weapon and uh, words. So I am basically against all, uh, the, um, all the weapons that are being selling, not just nuclear. I need a Middle East without weapon. And th that's why I'm saying this is a dream, because uh, in reality there is a lot of uh, politic uh, um, on politician that uh, using the weapon to get more uh, to get stronger in the in the in the Middle East. So they think this is the way, and it was the way that they get stronger. So speaking about uh, Middle East without nuclear, I feel that it's we should speak about Middle East uh, without weapon. 
uh, we cannot use the weapon correctly. The weapon is for defend, I accept that, but it shouldn't be more than this. So uh, in Iraq, uh, we had a very good uh, sample for this because the weapon was uh, for defense. We had a lot of problems and we needed the weapons in the, in the Iraq. So uh, that's why it's important to have uh, weapons and uh, to defend yourself. But when it goes more than that, then we have the problem. So I feel we should uh, teach our uh, society to fix the problems through dialogue and speech and not through weapon. And this is, as I said, it's a dream we should all work on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I have a request from Nada Daif from Bahrain. If he wants to address a few words to the, um, to the forum uh, from Bahrain's perspective, but keep it short, please. Thank you, Mr. Amarsi. Thank you, uh, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. Um, well, actually, I was uh, talking with Mr. Youssef about the necessity of having a mediation center that's in the region because all the mediation work that has been um, done uh, in the region uh, from the West, mainly America, and they don't understand uh, the nature of uh, uh, our region. So here I'm putting the request to consider having that. And thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I then had a request from some of our panelists to be able to share concluding remarks, but given that we are really running late, I would please ask you to confine it, if you want to, to one minute only, please. Thank you. Uh, I just feel like um, maybe I drew a very bleak picture of, uh, of the security uh, situation and militarization of, uh, of maritime uh, channels and so on. Uh, but I think it's an opportunity, uh, especially in Yemen. Uh, first, I, I don't believe that anyone wants to see a full-blown conflict. Uh, no one wants to see this escalation reach to a point that it, is, it becomes out of control. No one wants to see a big party of non-state actors, Houthis and others, um, uh, you know, uh, becoming adventurous with their drones in, uh, in the seas. This affects everyone, China of course included, but uh, world com commerce in, in general and uh, critical economies from Egypt to, to others that are uh, suffering economically at the moment. So I think it's an opportunity for uh, what also I was inspired by from the discussions in the last two days, which is um, a more intentional, more comprehensive, uh, multilateral cooperation. Um, Yemen, unlike Ukraine or Syria or, or Palestine, Israel, is there is, you know, to a large extent, uh, international uh, community consensus on Yemen. When the UN Security Council Resolution 2216 was was passed after the Houthi capture of uh, of the capital Sana'a, uh, everyone in the Security Council voted for, with one abstention from uh, Russia. So I think Yemen is not. Um, a point of contestation very much uh, within the international community, which makes it an opportunity for uh, cooperation and, uh, and hopefully to everyone's benefit. Thank, Thank you. you. I think His Royal Highness would like to address a few words from the floor, please. Um, thank you. I was reminded when I'm my time as Director of Intelligence in Saudi Arabia that uh, we had a uh, terrorist attack at that time in the city of Dahran. Uh, this is going back to the mid-1990s, which was traced at that time to a party that called itself the Hezbollah and the Hijaz. And I remember at that time it, the kingdom had a security agreement with, uh, with Iran, and uh, the Ministry of Interior was coordinating with with uh, their uh, Iranian counterparts. Anyway, the perpetrators uh, fled from Saudi Arabia and went to Iran, eventually ending up in Lebanon, where finally one of them was captured back to actually in Lebanon and was brought back to face trial in, in the kingdom. Uh, my point is that because of the China's intercession with, uh, between Saudi Arabia and, 
and uh, Iran, um, the, the, the security uh, agreement between the two countries has been revived. Uh, and now, uh, hopefully, that events like that will not occur uh, anymore as an understanding of the rapprochement that happened between Iraq, between Iran and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. This is just a state, non-state actor that was happening there. Thank you very much. So we will end the panel here. And if I could please request His Royal Highness to come onto the stage uh, and join us for a group picture, uh, plus His Excellency, uh, Mr. Khadam, uh, Nasser Hadian, please, if you would like to join, because you did ask a question. Um, it would be great as well.